My pleasure to introduce the second and last speaker in our series of historical lectures this afternoon. Um, the topic really is about perspective. So you've heard one way of reimagining ENIAC, and now you're going to hear a little bit about reimagining the valley, uh, past, present, and future, right? Yeah. So Christine Finn is a journalist and an archaeologist with a history in of, uh, an interest in the history of computing and the people who do computing and how the computing affects us. So I'll just let her go, right? Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much, Jack. It's wonderful to be here. I really love coming to vintage computer festivals. And this is my first one in the Midwest. I've just come from the West Coast. So um, right, that's the book that uh, came out um, 15 years ago, pretty much to the day. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Uh, a lot has changed, obviously, since then, and um, I'm also very mindful of, uh, for Americans and for British people and for other people, quite how symbolic this day is for you all. So I came across Silicon Valley in a very different way. I'm not trained as, a, uh, as a, an engineer, I'm not a techie, um, but I am interested in how things change and change over time, particularly in process. So I ended up in Silicon Valley through um, something some of you will be familiar with, um, actually, sorry, I'll go back to that, um, which is serendipity. It's quite often when I'm talking to you all about how you've got your collections together or how you found this extraordinary piece of kit, there's always a story of, oh, I just managed to get it because I overheard this and then that happened. And it's wonderful to hear these stories. And so how I came to Silicon Valley is one of those stories. But first of all, I want to talk about the fact that, you know, I am trained as an archaeologist. I'm a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. And it's the sort of place that one associates with, um, you know, rather more formal ways of excavating and evaluating the past. That's the inside of it. Um, it's 300 years old. And Schliemann, Heinrich Schliemann, whose name you might know from Mycenaean Troy, um, gave his papers there when he was describing what he was finding with the great treasures from, from the late um, 19th century. And so it might come as a bit of a surprise to you that the Society of Antiquaries has um, welcomed me to give a talk on Silicon Valley and retro technology and what I'm finding out here and what you're very familiar with um, as a public lecture at the end of November. So um, this is, in a way, a bit of a prequel to it, because what I want to do is to show you how I've been talking about Silicon Valley since I came across it in 2001, and the different ways that I've been trying to articulate your stories, because I'm really passionate about what you're doing. I think it's really fantastic. And it has been a bit of a, um, a task, um, particularly in somewhere like the UK, where although we've got a very strong um, computer history, it's not as well known as it is in America with your technology, which has obviously been spreading for rather a lot longer. So the Silicon Valley that I came to, um, which you're f all familiar with, I came to, as I said, through a happenstance. I got bumped off a flight um, on my way to um, the Bay Area. Uh, I was going to meet um, a, 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 an old friend who was coming in from Sydney. And there was no way in those days, in the autumn of 1999, to let him know I wasn't able to arrive. So when they offered me a flight to San Jose, I thought I would take it, not knowing anything about it, apart from a song title. Um, and on the flight, I got talking to this guy, who was um, 26, and he had three companies, and he was commuting between the Bay Area and Phoenix. And what was incredible for me was, you know, he was sitting there with a Palm Pilot. And I said to him, that's cute. How long has that been out? And he said, it comes out tomorrow. I designed the email for it. And it was that sort of moment of epiphany that I had. I thought, wow, I wonder how people are coping with history in Silicon Valley. I wonder if anyone's actually um, collecting it. I wonder how they feel about history in this place that's so much about the, fo the f forward thinking and the future. So um, I came back in the early days of 2000, literally in January, and uh, decided to find out what I could about this old valley of heart's delight. I mean, a lot of these things will be very familiar with you. Um, forgive me if I'm uh, telling you what you already know, but this is how I've been trying to, to get the story out um, to students in, in England and um, in various talks. And I came across the Intel Museum, which had um, its own in-house museum of artifacts. 
And I went to visit and found um, that they were collecting them rather like a, a museum would. And I traced, um, you'll see there that there's a, a piece of packaging um, with a note attached to it. So I traced the person who wrote the note uh, back to a guy called George Chu. And he had worked at Fairchild and then moved over to Intel, and he was one of the first 10 people to be um, a, an employee at Intel. And it started to get me thinking about the personal way that people were telling their own stories about Silicon Valley. And I was aware that you know, the big players like Jobs and Wozniak and Bill Gates were able to tell their stories, but there were so many other stories that weren't being told, which was important for them to, be, um, to have a voice. And the Computer History Museum was starting to collect those stories, which I was really excited about. Um, this person you may be very familiar to, Salam Ismail. Um, this was him photographed in his uh, warehouse, the first one I visited in uh, 2000. And Salam, I would say, was a pioneer in computer collecting in, in the Bay Area um, and probably within America. Um, I know that uh, he has a very personal way of collecting and he actually put himself out to, to gather mainframes and, and pieces of kit that people didn't really recognize. So he became my everyman um, in my journey into Silicon Valley and the whole field of computer collecting. As you know, he founded the Vintage Computer Festival. Um, we went to a place called Weird Stuff and I remember looking on the floor of Weird Stuff and thinking, Gosh, that looks like an archaeological context. And I actually, um, that's something you could plan. We've certainly photographed and plan. And I took this photograph um, and gave an early paper um, to some archaeologists in a conference in Ljubljana. It was a conference about computers and archaeology in the sense of computers as a, um, a valid tool in archaeology, as opposed to taking um, the objects of computing and turning them into archaeology. So there was a bit of puzzlement when I was showing this, but I just had a hunch. I felt there was something that was going on that I really wanted to work with. And also, I was fascinated by the other stuff, the ephemera of, of um, the computer age. I think this is a wonderful um, exhibit from uh, Salam's collection of these uh, safe, exciting experiments. And I'm sure you will have seen with the lovely stand outside with the, um, the so-called toys of how people um, related to computers. And again, back to Salam and the sorts of things that he was collecting. Again, very common stuff for you to know. But for me to be talking about this to archaeologists and archaeology students about the sorts of things that were becoming valuable, not just in sense of, of being financially valuable, but valuable because they were being discarded so quickly and they needed to be saved. Um, in the Valley, a wonderful paper called Mercury News was fantastic at documenting what was going on, and they were certainly not in a thrall to technology. Um, they accepted what was going on around them, but they were very um, mindful of the changes, and they had a whole series of, of um, adverts that were very poignant and very powerful. Um, so your phone is wireless, your office is virtual, and your social life is non-existent. Well, when I went out um, with some of... Um, with uh, Jack, uh, a, a guy in the middle, and the two Toms on the outside, and the other Tom I, I met, as I said, on the plane. Um, it was a very interesting thing to go out on a Saturday night in uh, San Jose in 2000, because people were constantly coding, and they would go onto the dance floor still with their laptops and still doing stuff on the side. I'm sure, again, this is stuff that you know about. Um, but it was absolutely fascinating, and that night I stayed at um, Tom and Tom's apartment in San Jose on the couch. And when I woke up, I was looking at the stuff that was on their mantelpiece. And I thought, this is a really interesting, sort of, again, an archaeological array, because you'll pick up there things that were sort of uh, symbolic of status, of, of things that were, you know, in-house stuff like to do with Linux and the penguins and uh, all of that, and stuff that was bought from Fry's. Um, particularly, and things that were, again, well, you wouldn't associate them with the story of Silicon Valley, but they're very much powerful as, as part of that. And when the crash happened and the two Toms left this apartment, um, all of this stuff was distributed elsewhere. So it was actually a, a snapshot, um, like a time capsule. Um, I was also fascinated by the, the Computer History Museum's collection of um, of ways in which uh, computers were marketed. And this one you might be familiar with from the 1970s. 
the, um, the kitchen computer. Um, this was used for the, the front of a, a Christmas catalogue and they apparently didn't sell a single one. Um, but it's such a beautiful thing that when Wired magazine went to the Computer History Museum and were planning to take one photograph, they ended up doing you know, several page spread because they got excited by the gloss and the look of the objects, as I'll be showing again later. Um, so, again, talking about happenstance, there happened to be an auction on the 1st of, um, of April in 2000, and those of you who know about April Fool's jokes, um, I went along there not knowing what I was going to find, but it was the first actual um, auction of technology as we would think about it today. And uh, that's a beautiful poster that was part of the sale. And within there, there was um, a slide rule um, which was a slide rule, interesting piece of kit, but it actually belonged to Press for Record. So as you've just heard, those of you who heard the um, ENIAC talk, um, one of the designers of, of the ENIAC and Press for Record's widow had found a whole load of stuff in their attic after her, her, her husband died. And she thought there might be some interest there. And um, so this was brought in for auction along with Another piece of kit, which again you will recognise, and um, uh, one of the tubes. And um, so the, the auction was very interesting because it started with regular electronic gizmos and um, automata and that sort of stuff. And it worked its way through. And I realised that I was one of only about half a dozen people that were left at the end um, who were obviously waiting for something. And this was the, the star object. And I did actually find out about um, three or four months later who had bought it. And I shall show you a bit later on um, who did. But it was very exciting to feel that there was something else shifting in terms of what was being sold. Um, things that were, uh, you know, you could demonstrate were part of the story of Silicon Valley in, in a way. Um, meanwhile, back in the valley, and again, trying to get this story across to people in England who are not technologists, students of archaeology and material culture who really don't know the area. And again, another one of those terrific Mercury News ads. But of course, now, I mean, I think that would be a million dollar estate. That would be a bargain um, compared to what it is these days. Um, and also the history of, of computing. I talked about the Intel Museum. Um, Hewlett Packard, of course, bought the, the house that had the garage. So they really wanted just the garage, but they got the house that went with it. Um, in Palo Alto, that would be. And of course, the landscape was changing. Um, I found, you know, I was talking to people at orchards, uh, as I showed earlier on. And I wanted to find out, you know, that the, the idea of the Valley of Heart's Delight being so full of blossom on the breeze that you could smell it. And only uh, you know, a few days ago, I was talking to someone who used to come to the valley in the 60s and 70s and talking about driving up on the side of the 280 and plucking oranges from the trees. And even in the late 90s, talking to people, teenagers would say, ah, oh, I remember the orchards, as though they had this enormous heritage and they certainly had this great power. Um, and uh, I was going looking for orchards and people would email me and say, oh yes, there's an orchard still there on X and X. And then I get another email uh, a few hours later to say, no, that went yesterday. So I was chasing my tail. Um, by this point, MIT Press had commissioned the book because um, it was felt that there was something very powerful that I could attach archaeology to. But I was still approaching it, I suppose, in terms of um, looking at the culture that had moved across with the workers from Silicon Valley and what would remain. Um, and talking about cultures that had come across, this was a Scandinavian family, the Olsons. And um, as you appreciate, as land became much more um, expensive before the crash happened, um, there was a lot of pressure on people to sell what they had. And the Olsons were a 99-year-old company, and there was a, a family dispute, and it went to court. And the father and the daughter, Deborah Olson, lost, and the, the, um, the orchards were sold off for development. And Deborah told me about um, when she knew it was all going to happen, gathering the workers together who'd worked there over the years, and they had storytelling underneath the, the trees, which was very poignant. And then she and her father went away, and they came back, and they found the whole lot raised. Um, they now still have a cherry stand, if any of you know the area, um, in Sunnyvale. 
um, and they import cherries, cherries from Chile. Um, in the background, you can see the, the buildings that are being developed. And the, all of this happened just as the crash was starting. So for a couple of years, the buildings that were built there were white elephants. So you had this extraordinary poignancy. It's very Chekhovian of the, you know, the cherry orchard and the idea of, of progress. And yet you've got the situation um, as it unfolded. But of course, being Silicon Valley, it didn't stay that way for very long. So again, getting back to the material culture and what was valuable in terms of, of what was being saved, um, I would always talk to students about it wasn't just the computers, it was the manuals that were so important to be saved because through that um, the computers could be run again. Um, and as you're very aware that um, a lot of you who, who have computers and manuals know how to get lost data out of machines, which is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, I went into Yahoo and talked to them about their marketing. So I was fascinated by the signs that were appearing, or uh, well, the two main signs that appeared for Yahoo, one in New York um, and one on the freeway, the 101. And Yahoo described it as being, again, getting back to the material culture, a nice and safe place to stay um, on the web. Um, so they replicated the old motel sign. Um, people would get married underneath the sign, um, or rather they would pose underneath the sign after they got married in New York, and then send the photographs back to Yahoo. So that became part of their material culture, the collection as well. And uh, you'll be familiar possibly with this one that uh, was on the side of the motorway on the 101, or the freeway, sorry. Um, and of course, um, when Yahoo started to, to lose ground, um, this started to, to lose its trajectory and its power as well. Um, and quite literally at one point when there was a lot of brownouts going on in Silicon Valley, um, the sign on here was, was changed to here, take our electricity, and they turned the sign out. Um, getting back to the, the longer story, the long durée of, of um, Silicon Valley, this couple were around um, so many years, and I used to be quite fascinated by the tree that was outside their house and the, what the tree had observed. Um, they came to the valley testing um, small bits of kit before computers and also um, checking salads for freshness. And then they moved on, they evolved over their lives to checking um, computers. And this was the home of, uh, of somebody who collected deck, um, who lives uh, or lived just outside LA in the Hollywood Hills. And his house was absolutely stuffed with deck manuals and kit. And then he moved to Bollywood and he had the whole lot shipped over to, to Germany. He gave it to the museum over there, as you know, the VCF in Munich's really um, strong. And while all of this was happening, the idea of it being shipped over reminded me of something called the Uluburun shipwreck. Um, which was a, a ship from the Bronze Age, um, which went down in the Mediterranean. And they were able to trace the route of this journey through um, the Mediterranean by the types of, of um, produce and objects on board. And I was wondering how they could do that if, it had, if the ship had gone down with all this deck equipment, because it had gone from the East Coast to the West Coast and all over the place, and then suddenly back to Germany. So, you know, again, it was an example to talk to student archaeologists about, to try and get them thinking about um, the contemporary archaeology of the, of the computer age um, as we could then map it back onto the ancient world. Um, Marvin, who's here, who was certainly outside and he's in the room now, um, was someone I visited in Santa Barbara with his collection, which was over, had overgrown the house, was now in the car as well. And this is a very early picture of the Computer History Museum when it was in pretty much um, prefabs before it moved to the old um, SGI building. Um, of course, at the time of the crash, it had secured quite a bit of funding from philanthropists for a purpose-built museum at NASA Ames. And when the crash happened, it lost a lot of money. But it was able to take over the SGI building. So I found that really fascinating that it's turned into an artifact, and it's gone into an artifact, rather. And within that building, you can find chairs that still have the SGI sign on as well. So again, you've got these wonderful layers of, of time and archaeology and people's memory coming through. And I went to places that were dealing with <coughs> unwanted tech, um, remaking, um, killing old chips and, and places that in a way seemed more archaeological in, in you know, thinking back to Schliemann again in terms of the gold and the bins of gold and much more 
an image, I think, that reminds us of, of archaeology in another way. Um, and also uh, things that were not um, ever meant to be used, that were wrapped up. Um, you might find that now with some of the, the more precious, uh, more valuable computer artifacts of today, that people don't open the box. They just, somebody said to me, they cling, cling um, film it or wrap it um, and have no intention of using it. Um, and this, another image that could have come out of straightforward archaeology, this is some of the uh, metal, again, salvaged from old computers. And another way I was looking at archaeology um, was the, the layering of Photoshop. And uh, Julianne Coste, who's an artist employed by Adobe um, as an evangelist, described making this image. And as I was watching her describe it um, and on her computer, all the layers, again, were reminding me of these, the way that we work in archaeology and pull things back. But of course, she can then replicate it and bring it all forward. Um, so when the crash happened, um, again, Silicon Valley paper, the Mercury News, came out very pithily with this one. Um, but then people were wondering, what about our history? And that's when I found um, that there was a real race on for me to gather as much material as I could because things were changing so quickly and stuff that hadn't already been, been dumped was in this sort of liminal state. I was working outside of um, uh, Silicon Valley some of the time because I was back in Oxford as a research associate in the Institute of Archaeology, which is where I got my doctorate, but in archaeology and poetry. So I'm used to putting archaeology in other places. And I asked them in the computer labs there whether they had anything that was, um, would be regarded as collectible or saveable. And they just sort of showed me a cardboard box and said, well, you might have a route through there, there's something. And I found this very interesting. This was, um, uh, those of you who are familiar with um, academics within, uh, or technology within the academic world will know much more about this than I do. I'm still trying to find out a bit more. Um, but first reply from foreign user, hooray, and it's um, you know, within universities, and it was only February 1988, which sounds to me awfully recent. Um, so we get to the, the end of uh, VCF in, uh, on the West Coast in 2007. I made this installation, which um, you can also see behind, um, when I was there, because I was really wanting to, uh, to move from the, the collecting side of things to seeing how I could, other ways that I could engage with retro technology. So I went, went back to weird stuff and found a, a bunch of wires, as you say, and cables and, uh, and set this up. It was a bit of a homage to Ada and, and to Jacquard and the whole idea of the, the materiality of technology, which I get very excited by. So the next thing, um, and I'm mindful of your time because I know you're all packing up, um, it's really to regroup. So I, the, the Artifacts book came out in 2001, the paper about 2002. By that time, um, things were you know, sliding in Silicon Valley and really people weren't terribly interested in anything to do with that place. Those who'd um, caught a cold there um, really didn't want to read about it when it was in the boom time. And, um, and those who didn't know mu much about it, you know, what to do with it. However, archaeology started to embrace it, and it became part of a, an area called contemporary archaeology, um, which is now very vigorous as a, as a discipline. So I was um, inspired to carry on, and so for the last 15 years, I have been collecting even more technology stories and traveling further to, to meet collectors and to, to get um, their stories and their, their input. Um, and so this last month, I went back to the VCF, the new VCF rebooted um, on the West Coast and, uh, and saw, saw Salam, who's now ceded it, as you know, um, to the Federation, which sounds like something out of Star Wars, I was <laughs> saying that. Um, you know, back in the valley, the history is, is now pretty um, obvious. The Computer History Museum is such a, a place that um, Obama had one of his um, meetings there fairly recently. Um, and you see art imposed on the landscape in terms of the um, you know, objects like this. It, it's not so removed. Art and, and archaeology and Silicon Valley are, are come together very well here. Um, but there are other places where you have a much more subtle approach, and Bruce Damer is someone who you might know. He's a friend of mine from 2000, and he has um, a wonderful collection of computers in his Digibarn, which is in an old um, 
pig farm up in Boulder Creek in the uh, Santa Cruz Mountains. And this is Bruce, as some of you might know him, and he quite often speaks at the Vintage Computer Festivals, and he's an avatar expert, and expert in many other things as well, and he wears his, um, his learnedness very lightly, I have to say. Um, this was one of his favourite and early pieces of kit, which is an old calculator. Um, in his Digibarn, he has some things, that, again, you'll be very familiar with, um, to do with uh, the early you know, homebrew type days and the more, the more sort of maker elements um, to do with early computers. I'll just flash through these because they'll be very familiar to you. And of course, a cray. And, some, and most of this is donated by, by Steve Wozniak or, or if not other people very high up in, in Apple. Um, the sort of corridor of t-shirts, which I shall come back to, which are very much symbolic. Um, VCF, again, an Apple One up for sale. And again, part of the material culture, the t-shirts, which are rather fun. And uh, the Federation duo. Um, and we're back with the Cray, and we're back in the Digibarn here. Um, and it gives some sort of idea about how people, or well, certainly Bruce, collects um, and stores papers and how he processes the cataloguing and the classification, which is a, a new thing. Um, when, <laughs> when I was um, uh, at the VCF West Coast, I was just taking lots of photos of things that, again, would be the, these you know, you've seen these all the way through, you've seen them outside, you've seen them for years. But taking this back to Britain and talking about the way that the VCF operates and the way that it's trying to get back to the, the idea of the, the community, which, and I feel it's more than trying to, it is a fantastic community, um, as like the old days. Um, so there's something very, if I say homespun, I don't mean it in any sort of derogatory way. I mean it in terms of, it's very comfortable. It's the sort of place that, anyone can come to, and even if they have no technology background, can have an engagement. And uh, these sorts of ads. Again, I'll spill, spin through this sort of stuff because you recognize it. And the free stuff, I think, again, is very poignant and very important um, to continue. Um, now we're back um, very suddenly on the, um, on the west coast of Seattle and the Living Computer Museum. I'm sorry, I had a bit of a, 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 a spinning wheel thing when I was doing my, um, my presentation. I tried to slide in some extra slides, which was probably a mistake. Uh, so we'll go back to that one in a minute. So the new generation of computer collectors, I think that's really important to see as well. I mean, over 15 years, what you've got, obviously, you know, it's the born digital generation and the millennials who are now seeing computers in a different way. I know when I've been lecturing at Bristol University over the last decade, and the first time that I um, gave this lecture, um, which is sort of similar to what I was showing in the, in the early part of this talk, I could see eyes glazing over and, well, this is old stuff. We're not interested in old stuff. It's redundant kit. You know, we want the new things. And now, because it's completely new to the generation coming through as students who are studying contemporary archaeology, there's a lot more engagement and people are starting to get it. And one of the questions that I asked um, at the beginning when I, I give the talk is, have any of you got a piece of kit that you no longer use but you can't bear to throw away? And it's the sort of thing that, you know, I've been asking for 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, et cetera, and generally a hand goes up and people acknowledge what I'm talking about. Now I'm talking or asking the question of 18, 19, 20-year-olds, and hands are going up, and they're having this, these wonderful and engaged and quite emotional sometimes, powerful conversations about kit that they've got that they started to, to learn X on, or they wrote... A, a paper on or their mum had got something in the attic and they, they really understand what I'm talking about when it's things that have a power beyond their intrinsic self. So the idea of the touching is very important. Again, you know all about this, but you know, a lot of people aren't don't um, think about uh, any sort of a collection of old things and being able to touch it. And that's really, really important because as you know, it is all about the living computer. A few more of these. These are now going to be a bit of a, um, 
it's like field work I've been gathering when I've been here and, um, and at the uh, VCF West Coast. So if you'll forgive me, there'll be some images coming up. It's going to be a bit show and tell, but you know the stuff. Um, so yeah, the, the heritage of the t-shirt, as I've talked about before. Um, the younger kids coming through. We're back at the Living Computer Museum now in Seattle. Paul Allen's museum, which is um, really rather wonderful. And Rick, one of the curators there, just give you an idea of this one. I looked at that and I thought, and this is where they're doing some work and so you can't go. And it reminded me again of an archaeology site that had been closed off for field work. Um, sorry, we've seen this one before, but the, again, the context. And Rick, with, um, again, another beautiful thing, uh, all the different um, names for programs that I didn't realise there were quite so many, and I find the whole thing really quite poetic. I was always fascinated years and years ago by Ada giving her name to a, a defence programme, and I think that fascination has stuck with me, as indeed I feel that coding is a form of poetry, um, and I've, you know, I'm working on that as, a, as another extension for my engagement with um, retro technology. And again, things that you'll be familiar with, the context brought together, the story here, the... Um, the advert that is quite ironic um, and the, the letter that goes with. I won't go into the detail of that because if those of you who know about um, that sort of kit will know exactly what I'm talking about. And the idea again of engaging people to come and be part of the exhibit. Um, and they're talking also about trying to, to get a way to get the smell of the exhibit out. out. And I remember Stan Mazer, the um, uh, Chip Pioneer saying to me that what he remembered so strongly about old computer rooms was the smell. And I can describe it as sort of burnt dust. And it's quite an extraordinary sort of smell that, you know, again, millennials today wouldn't really know um, what that is. So it'd be really great to recreate that. And that's more of the living computer museum. Um, again, I'm fascinated by the way the artifacts are laid out and how they look like. Um, a regular museum, but they have a lot of context that you perhaps wouldn't get in, in other ones. So when I was in Seattle, I went back to, um, to revisit the person who'd bought that, uh, that piece of ENIAC kit and the slide rule, as I, I, you might remember me saying. And of course, it was Nathan Meivold, who was number three at um, Microsoft. I mean, not in terms of he was number three in the list, but he was the technologist of the trio. And Nathan was a great person to interview in 2000. He let me come up and look at his computer collection, which was um, really quite extensive with curators at that time, and it's now got even bigger. He runs um, a, a wonderful lab called Intellectual Ventures, and um, this is, I mean, nothing there is done by chance, and this is a binary um, design for the entranceway to go into the main lab. And this is his collection of, uh, of slide rules and other calculating gear and Nathan himself he collects dinosaurs as well um, and also old typewriters which then have a different context when you put them with the dinosaur type collection and he's also a remarkable photographer so he's really is a, a renaissance man you probably probably know he's also a gourmet cook and he's written a number of cookbooks and he's working on um, the origins of bread making at the moment um, so this idea of the, the personality is so important. And again, this is something from VCF West um, and people's uh, identity and when they started in Silicon Valley was so important. I'm sorry, this is a random slide of the, um, of the dinosaur leg back at uh, Nathan's. So you'll have to forgive me. I'm, I'm making no allusions to the person I've just shown on the photograph. Um, the Babish machine that he funded, he funded two, one for the Science Museum in London and one which was at the Computer History Museum for a number of years, which is now back with his collection. And uh, a beautiful piece of kit. And um, he had uh, his engineer tasked with looking after it to, to run it, which was lovely. And so here we are now. And uh, I, I've been, as I said, I've been talking at VCFs in West Coast, East Coast, Munich, and it's the first time I've been here. And I'm very grateful to be invited. Um, I love the way that this looks like something out of Middle Earth. It's, uh, it should be Tolkien, should making, make a visit. Um, and uh, especially there's an elf there as well. Um, so I'm just going to now show you, uh, spin through a few things that I've been collecting. If any of you are in these photographs and A, you don't want to be shown 
anytime, anywhere, please let me know. And if you'd like a copy of one, please let me know and I can send it over to you. So this will be a bit of a fast spin through. The sorts of stuff that I've thought interesting coming as a sort of an outsider um, and that I will be using in, in my teaching and in my explanations of what VCF is all about. I think the setting up the, the night before is really very exciting too. And the engagement, again, I've been incredibly moved seeing the number of younger and children, uh, young people and children here, and this wonderful way of being able to tell story and share through technology. It's fabulous. And I think it's one of the real powers. If any of you know this young guy who was sitting down in the middle there, he was asking so many brilliant questions um, to do with Commodore. Um, if you know him, he's worth encouraging. He's, he, he could only come today, and I just um, hope he comes to more VCFs. He's great. Um, yeah, again, the look of, of this, which is sort of merging into a type of artwork for me, is what I feel. Um, again, the free stuff pile, hugely important. Uh, Belinda Brain, I couldn't help but buy a pair of her earrings. Um, she's got... Yeah, she's brilliant. <laughs> um, and also put an archaeologist anywhere near newspaper and you have me ferreting through, particularly as someone who's also an old journalist. Um, so I had to find the date of the newspaper and of course it's 1988. Fantastic. So an extra bit, extra layer for me there. Um, and again, the dialogues, uh, you know, the, the sharing, the trading. Um, and this couple knew me from uh, VCF, um, the first VCF I went to on the East Coast as well. So we hadn't seen each other for 15 years. In fact, that's been happening a lot this year, which is wonderful. Uh, the T-shirt that says it all. Is he in the room? <laughs> uh, and the lovely story here. This guy had been talking um, uh, with... Um, uh, let me see, find him in a second. Well, he'd been talking with somebody about... Uh, he hadn't actually met in person, but talking only through email about a piece of kit. And it was really lovely to hear him say, ah, oh, you're the person. And this is happening quite a bit. I think you guys do that quite a lot. And it's very, it's great to hear that happening. Um, yeah, back to the t-shirts. Kids. Blinking light things. Um, I thought this club also says an awful lot about, you know, if you read the, the criteria on the side there about what the club is, that's fabulous and that's worth um, holding on to and reading out when I have a, um, a moment to do that at, at some uh, occasion because it really is all about what you guys are doing. When I say guys, I mean gender unspecific. <laughs> and this I thought was fascinating. Uh, again, you know, early, it reminded me again of that, that game I saw in, in Salam's um, collection. And Belinda again with her cakes, which I think is another lovely part of the material culture. And this morning there she was making some more, and I'm going to take half a dozen away with me too. Um, again. And again, this is the, the you know knowing the story of this commodore from talking to John, isn't it? who who was um, preserved it, and and again another story of of happenstance and just grabbing something as he could and. Again, these are things that you're very familiar with, but to talk about these being collectible back in the UK is an unusual thing. Um, I loved watching this little guy working and keyboarding away because the number of times that an um, error message came up and he just kept at it. And I thought that was really something about the technology age, isn't it? You know, fail and fail again. Um, I remember interviewing a guy called, um, oh, I can't his name now, but he had a, a website called startupfailures.com back in, uh, in the day, in 2000, in Silicon Valley. And that was really fascinating, learning more about that philosophy of, of failure, which you know, is very much part of the story. Um, yeah, the previous one was about touch. Again, really important to see that. And again, that great material culture. and the setting up and the speakers being so much of a part of VCF as well. So thank you for that. And just running to the end of those ones. Um, if any of you think that I've missed an aspect that I really should be looking at the next VCF, please let me know, because I think it's, I'm trying to capture as much of the feeling as I can of, of 
the way that you all engage. See, that I think is really interesting. You know, again, what are these? Are, did anyone find out what they were, by the way? They're dad tapes. Oh, right. Okay, great. Now I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this I thought was really interesting. Does anyone claim those at all? Oh, great, because I saw you know, Mike's backup, and I thought, these must be so important, or were so important to somebody at some time that there was a backup. And we must have, you know, we've got gazillions of bits of data that we've backed up and backed up that we, you know, were important at one point. Um, so again, if you came across them in an archaeological context, you'd think that was incredibly valuable, um, as long as you could read it. Uh, and again, I can't help but look at surfaces and find the, it's a bit like the newspaper. <laughs> and gizmos and things like that. Yeah. So I was really pleased to find this um, early edition of Byte for $2 from um, Marvin. And um, I like the fact that it, you know, they're campaigning for two computers in every home. And uh, you were hearing earlier on about the number of computers that, that people have um, just by, by sense of what they have maybe in their bag with them that they carry around every day. Um, and I, I really like reading the articles policy here. I don't know if you've ever, any of you have ever looked at it, but it looks so, it is so utterly different. And someone who's, as speaking of someone who started in journalism when I was 16, I worked on, you know, saw the whole run through of typewriters through to web offset life, through, through to digital blogging, the whole thing. Um, I've got a lot of time for print. I adore it. And typewriters too. I really like working on a typewriter. And I just find this is a really interesting snapshot of how things were done not so long ago in the 70s. It could resist this as well, getting back to the T-shirts. And again, getting back to the art side of things, um, you know, again, these are beautiful and collectible. Um, I was in touch only a few days ago with a guy in, in London called James Ball, who is an art director, and he started to, to photograph um, British computers and doctor them in such a way that he really enhances their artistic quality. Now, I know I've had conversations with a few of you here about um, you know, this whole thing of retro technology being a thing and it moving outside the confines of what you're doing and going into the world as something else. And I know you've got you know, maybe different views on whether that's a good thing or not, um, but it is happening. And so James is very respectful and very excited by um, old computers in this way. So you might look at these images and think that this is, um, you know, it's not your approach, but it is a, an approach which is incredibly interesting now because it's getting people looking at these machines and appreciating them. And from that, they will start to read about them. And from that, will, they will almost certainly start to come to vintage tech events. So I'll just run through these. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, the, the book, the first, um, the, uh, uh, first edition has um, gone completely out of print. So, uh, you know, if you can find one, you're lucky. Um, but I just want to say, you know, how much this has given to me personally, the whole of the field of retro technology, computer collecting. And I'm extremely grateful for all the stories that I've, I've been told and all the amazing people I've met. When I came back into the room um, in the um, VCF, on the West Coast uh, last month. Um, it had been nine years since the last one, and it was like walking in on a family reunion. It was really terrific. And you know, you, you seem to be able to do this wherever you are, whatever VCF I've been to, whether it's in Munich or in America um, and elsewhere. And it's a very, very special thing. And I just want to applaud you for that. So thank you for coming. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Yeah. I heard this, and I don't know if it's 100% true, that uh, Steve Jobs and Apple always wanted to look forward, and they had no uh, showroom of past history or anything like that. Have you seen any of that in Silicon Valley, where people just don't want to look backwards, they just want to look forward? Well, it was more evident at the, at the end of the web 1.0, I think, when people were just, they'd had enough of the whole concept. You know, a couple of the guys that I, I showed um, whose 
who I went out with one evening, you know, they just left Silicon Valley completely. So as a concept, it was something people didn't want to deal with. But I think increasingly, um, people started to value the history. Um, Steve Wozniak, as you know, is a, is a collector. He's certainly very interested in computer history. And you've got, um, I know it's not Silicon Valley per se, but, you know, up in Seattle, um, Paul Allen's museum and, um, and Nathan. So I, I think there is an appreciation that's come out of, again, the millennial and the hipster movement, um, the maker fair phenomenon. You know, people are still fascinated by kits and putting things together. And a lot of the retro movement um, over the last decade, I would think, has been driven by people wanting to replicate old things and put um, modern devices in wood wooden boxes. Um, and I know in certainly places like Japan, a retro phone is a, you know, a mark of, of honor to have something the bigger the better. Now I remember learning to use a mobile phone when it was the size of a brick on a newspaper in, in Britain in the late 90s. So, late 80s, sorry. So I think it is it's a question of one's own personal history as well. Um, but certainly people are trading within generations their stories. And I think as people get more confidence in where technology is going, then they will have more confidence to look at it in, in the more historical terms as well. I can't speak as a historian, and, and obviously um, you would have a, have a different conversation with you. But um, yeah, I think there's less of a, a fear of looking back. And maybe there was a fear before when people didn't quite know where they were going. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. OK. Thank you.